Hello, I'm William Zogby. I'm the chair of cardiology here at Houston Methodist, the Baker Heart and Vascular Center. And it's a pleasure to have Dr. Joseph Hill today with us. He's the chair of cardiology at the University of Texas Southwestern and also uh, the head of the Heart and Vascular Center, also chief editor of Circulation. It's great to have you, Joe. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. My pleasure. What, what a wonderful Grand Rounds you gave today. And I, I'd like to ask our viewers to take a look at these Grand Rounds because you gave such an insight into different mechanisms of heart failure, particularly in your new uh, animal model for HFPEF. Well, thank you. You, you know, I, we're, we're, all, we're both investigators. My, my strategy always has been to start with disease. I see disease in patients and we study those diseases in animals and we drill down into mechanism, and, but we start with the disease phenotype. Wonderful. Well, since, we, since you're addressing this, because you're seeing a clinician delving into the basic sciences and clinical investigation, seems to be in the nation and even worldwide. Uh, this is a challenge for investigators, uh, particularly the clinical investigators who have a clinical hat. And we see our emerging leaders struggling with that, uh, the chiefs of cardiology struggling with that, uh, hospital administrators struggling with that. They want clinical work, much more RVU-based. How do you manage it, and what's your advice to both the cardiologists, the emerging cardiologists, as well as chiefs of cardiology and administrators? How do we balance this? And, and what are some of the challenges and maybe some of the solutions? Because your department has, has done a great job in that. Well, I don't pretend to have figured it out, but um, what I tell people in my lab and, and what I've told my sons is there are an infinite number of beautiful biological riddles to solve. There are a subset of them that matter to human beings. I would choose to work on those. And, um, you know, it's the clinicians who know what the problems are, but very often they're not equipped to answer those questions. Conversely, the PhDs are professional problem solvers but sometimes they don't know what the realities look like in the human context. And bringing those two worlds together, as you say, is an enormous challenge and an enormous opportunity. I, and again, I, I don't begin to have a solution to that. I, I did, six months ago, or nine months ago, had organized a Keystone conference where, on heart failure, where we had multiple sessions about the different types of heart failure, ischemic heart failure, diabetic cardiomyopathy, HFPEF. And we started each session with a clinician who told the story of what this looks like. In the trenches, this is what ischemic heart disease looks like to me every day. And here is what I wish I had in my toolbox. And then we had basic science talks about how to fill that toolbox. And that, you know, that one several day event brought those two worlds together. Exactly. The, the, the problem solvers and the problem knowers were having a dialogue, bi-directional conversation. I think that's wonderful, and I think this hybrid of a clinical investigator with some protected time, unfortunately, is, is challenged at this stage of the game. It cannot be 10, 15 percent protected time where you can't, you know, do much, you know, serious investigation. So, but I think that the either crosstalk collaboration or almost a 50-50 where you could do some clinical work but dedicate enough. Uh, research time for it to be meaningful. Uh, do you agree with that? I do. I certainly do. And uh, and you know I won't pretend to suggest that it's easy at our place any more than it is here. The um, you know no margin, no mission, and and I, I, you know we all understand that. Um, we're both blessed to be at places where the ultimate platform is an academic one. You know we we see patients because we want to provide care, we want to educate the next generations, and we want to do research, and that's. That's why we have a business. The business exists to serve the academic mission. And, you know, sadly, there are some places that are no longer like that, but both, both yes. of us are blessed to be at a place that, that is Going is back to the science portion, your grand rounds, uh, I think your model, your animal model is fascinating for HFPEF. And I have a couple of questions for that. One is, uh, where do you see this synergistic mechanism of pressure and metabolism coming through? Is this pretty much through INOS and, and the others and protein unfolding? 
Uh, and why would it be, uh, and, and you mentioned in your grand rounds also the mitochondria are so confused <laughs> as to how to react to this kind of thing. Uh, what is, do you think, the common ground or common mechanism? So that's one. Two, if we take away one of these two factors, do you see reversibility in the animal model? Because that has been a challenge from a clinical point of view. If you treat hypertension in somebody who's obese and has, so, uh, you know, do you, you don't necessarily reverse much of that. There must be some other factor, inflammation in a different way, or something in this metabolic syndrome. Your, your thoughts about that? Well, you know, it's still a work in progress, but um, I'm pretty convinced, at least right now, that these inflammatory events are, are pivotal. That, um, as I mentioned, obesity is an inflamed state. And um, the, you know, the recent reality, understanding that INOS upregulation is a part of this so-called metabolism-related inflammatory response, I, I think may be a, a pivotal observation that has, that may lead to insights in this, in this syndrome. Uh, it, it, so far it is, and as I mentioned in a couple of instances when we've checked in two different uh, contexts with human uh, samples, it, it appears to be a play. Now, there are only two ways to cure HEFPEF in people so far, and that's exercise and bariatric surgery. It's very difficult, at least in Dallas, to get people to lose weight. <laughs> and uh, you may find this interesting, that if you take a mouse and you take away the high-fat diet and give it regular chow, yes. it is so upset with you that it, that mouse will not eat for three days. So you're basically taking away a Big Mac and giving them a salad, and those mice will lose like 20% of their weight because they want that Big Mac again. So it turns out that experiment is it's technically addictive. difficult to do. <laughs> it's hard to do that experiment. It's addictive. So do you see with some of the newer mechanisms, at least, yes, it hasn't been unraveled, all of it has been unraveled yet, but with these newer mechanisms, a therapeutic target? Well, you know, it's a work in progress, but right now, uh, Targeting a surgical strike on INOS, I believe, has potential. The, uh, to my knowledge, that has never been done. INOS suppression doesn't lower blood pressure. It's not a secondary effect through that. There, there's an, an emerging notion that um, NO signaling, like many things, is more complicated than we thought. It's not just a global bath of NO. It's compartmentalized both spatially and temporally. It matters if it comes from ENOS or if it comes from INOS and it matters how much how there much is. There. So all of these realities, I think, are proving to be informative in, in this syndrome. You know, I, again, I, I, I want to emphasize that this model, about which I'm very excited, I don't believe it's all of HEFPEF. I believe it's a lot. I believe it's a lot of the kind of HEFPEF that we see with patients who are obese with, with metabolic dysfunction and, and hypertension. Uh, and but I don't is, think it's all Loss is the amazing. Uh, rather rapidity of seeing these effects and if you withdraw them, some of that recovery. And, and I do hope that translates somewhere into the clinics because yes, the hypertension, the inflammation, the vascular remodeling on, the, on a chronic situation as opposed to acute situation in the, in the animal lab may still have some lingering effects down mm -hmm. the line. Right. And maybe maybe town, tone down the reversibility of such a such a syndrome, don't you think so? I, I do. I mean, I, I'll, I'll confess that we were very surprised at how is, quickly you could turn it around. Very surprised. Amazing. Three days of blocking INOS, I would never have thought. I didn't mention that we've done those experiments in INOS knockout mice, and we see the same thing. And so looking at it two different ways. But, um, you know, in, in the work that we've done so far, we've looked at, I mean, bona fide INOS, I mean, bona fide HEFPEF. These animals have heart failure. But, you know, if we took them out three months or six months, you know, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if some of that is no longer reversible. That, that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Well, I think what you showed us today is, in your grand rounds, is the power of, of taking a challenging issue, maybe uh, stimulated by one of the trainees, <laughs> one way or right. another, and, and uh, challenging, uh, you know, people what they've done and looking into newer mechanisms and it looks like it's, it's really elucidating some newer mechanisms, particularly for a challenging uh, clinical issue that we haven't been able to do much for. So very well, much appreciate Well, I hope so. Thank you. I'm excited about it. I hope, I hope it, you know, it, like any model, it's as good as it is today. You know, we'll see if it holds up tomorrow. And so far, it's holding up. Well, thank you again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Hosting you.
And thank you again for uh, your continued uh, viewing of our Debakey channel, and uh, we wish you the best.